Tony Abbott has been using the phrase budget emergency. But is this term justified? Let's hear from the Chief Economist at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Saul Eslake. Welcome to The Drum. Thanks for having me, Julian. Now, Dr Eslake, there are many tough cuts outlined by the Audit Commission, as expected. But have they actually established that there is a budget emergency? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure that they have uncontrovertibly established that Australia is facing a budget emergency. Certainly the situation is worse than the previous government had suggested it would be. Certainly it's worse than it should have been given that we're now 22 years out from the last recession and we've just been through the biggest upswing in commodity prices in over 150 years. But even having said all of that, the business as usual case which the Commission of Audit says is unsustainable results in the level of net public debt at the end of 2023-24 being 17% of GDP. Now that's just two and a half percentage points higher than it is today. It's about a percentage point and a half less than it was at the end of the Hawke-Keating era. It compares with an average level of net public debt for advanced economies at the end of 2013 of 73.5% and while I'm not suggesting that that figure or anything like it should be an aspirational goal for Australia, if you compare Australia with Canada which I think it's legitimate to do since Canada is a triple A rated country and it has a federal system and an economy that's probably more like ours than any other country on the planet. Their net public debt is going to stabilise at just under 40% of GDP over the next few years and no one's talking about Canada facing a budget emergency. So uh, I don't think they've established that case beyond doubt nor have they established that the only way to solve the problem if you believe it's a problem is through through big expenditure cuts. And I have a lot of sympathy for some of the specific recommendations the Commission has made and I'm happy to support them. But as you were just saying earlier, uh, they haven't really looked at the revenue side and it's interesting to note that the ceiling of 24% of GDP uh, for taxation revenue that they propose without any supporting argument is actually a percentage point below the average level that taxes were as a proportion of GDP during the Howard years. Right, I want to ask you about some of those specific recommendations, but before we do, I mean, if, if there have been similar emergencies in the past, I mean, are you saying, are we, do you think there's a chance we're being alarmist? Oh, I think some people are being alarmist. Again, I repeat, the situation is worse than the previous government had said it would be. It's worse than it should be, but I don't think it's anywhere near the crisis situation that many other Western countries have been facing since the onset of the financial crisis. Now, we don't want to, I'm not using them as a benchmark as to where we should be aspiring to, but I just think we ought to have a sense of perspective about this. I think the Commission is right in saying that if the changes that need to be implemented are implemented incrementally over a 10-year period of time, then they can be done without doing any serious damage to the economy. But if the government were in the forthcoming budget to try to reduce the budget deficit for the 2014-15 financial year by, say, a percentage point of GDP in one swoop, as John Howard and Peter Costello sought to do in their first budget, then uh, I think that would inflict some serious short-term damage in the, on the economy. And there wouldn't be the scope as there was in 96 97 to cut interest rates by two percentage points or to have the currency fall by 20 cents as it did then to cushion the impact of those measures. Well, what do you make of the, uh, the Audit Commission's report in terms of suggestions regarding expenditure? For example, the tightening of welfare benefits. Oh, by and large, I support that. I think the age, pension age should be linked to life expectancy in the way that they propose. I support the change they've suggested to the annual indexation of pension arrangements. Mm -hmm. And I think there ought to be tighter means testing of pension, uh, access to the pension in the way that they propose. I think they're all worthy suggestions. And while I respect the government's promise not to change the pension or superannuation arrangements before the uh, 2016 election, uh, the Commission is proposing that these things take up to 2050 before they're fully implemented, which is hardly rushing it. Right. But we all would assume that the world will just go on the way it is now. And I think a lot of the thinking about budget crisis is that we've had the 2007 
financial downturn globally. And when we entered that, we had a surplus and no real debt, not, not substantial debt. And as Greg Sheridan pointed out in a piece in The Australian the other day or today, that we have nothing. Europe has their size, the Americans have their dollar, even the Japanese have some, something to, to, to hold on to. We are a small, reasonably small nation with nothing much to umbrella us. And if we have, if China is looking very, very worrying at the moment, and if our income does drop substantially as an exporting nation, we really have very little to fall back on. So if well, we don't if act we now, we have problems in about five or seven years. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't take some action. Uh, as I say, I support many of the Audit Commission's recommendations, and I think there's also a good case, although they haven't made it, for doing things that would broaden the revenue base. I'm not in favour of increasing the rates of any existing taxes, but I certainly think there, think there are things that can be done to broaden the base of the income tax in ways that would predominantly impact on high income earners so they'd improve the neutrality and the equity of the tax system as well as contributing to the task of improving the budgetary position. But I just don't think we should be alarmist about it and to the point that was just being made if we found ourselves in the position that the US or Europe or uh, Japan had done in recent years, which we haven't done then we could do some of the things that they've done as well, such as having the central bank print money and seek to drive the exchange rate down. We haven't needed to do that those things in the last few years. Well, uh, would it be dreadful? I mean, there's an, awful lot of, there's an awful lot of... For well, Australia, like, it would be a very bad move. I think if you asked any manufacturer or any farmer or even a there mining not many company, left in the would they... Okay. Would, <laughs> would, All right, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, we've moved on from Dr. Esley, uh, um, but, but uh, Ben just had a very quick comment. So, just quickly, if you're going to means test the age pension, uh, shouldn't you be means testing retirement incomes more broadly yes. and doing something about the superannuation <laughs> tax concessions? Right. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. I, I think the, and I've said many times before, that the uh, superannuation system should be less generous to high income earners than it currently is. I'm not an advocate of abolishing all of the concessional tax treatment of superannuation. I think there is some rationale for rewarding people for uh, supporting themselves in retirement, but I certainly think there's considerable scope for making those concessions less generous than they presently are. And in particular, I strongly support the Audit Commission's recommendation that people's superannuation income should be taken into account when determining whether they have access to a senior's health care card.